So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shubham. Thanks for the kind introduction. And yes, I'm going to talk about browser extensions fingerprinting today. Uh, before I start, um, well, okay, yeah, this is my first time here. So I just thought like a small slide about myself would be great because we are here right after lunch. And yeah, just just some non-technical information here. So yes, I'm doing my PhD student at CISPA Hemoth Center in Zabrucken, Germany. And yeah, I want to, uh, I like to talk about all things application security, but my PhD mostly focuses on browser extensions and some PhD memes so that I f can survive and feel good at, you know, after my work is done. But yeah, that's pretty much about it. Um, this is like a very basic slide. I don't think I, I should have kept it, but yeah, the, we are talking about browser extensions, which are third-party client-side add-ons. Uh, they have different components with different level of privileges. We are going to focus on content script and uh, injected scripts for today about extension fingerprinting project that I'm going to talk about. Yes, these extensions are supported on all sorts of browsers. I just put Chrome and not Brave and Opera because these are Chromium browsers. And then these extensions are just not feature-rich, but also very popular. Oh, wait. This should have been ad block. Sorry, my bad. But yes, these extensions are popular. But we are going to talk about extension fingerprinting today. Why? 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 Right? Well, there has been some uncertainty around cookie-less tracking or, you know, third-party cookie deprecation. So cookie-less tracking is on rise. And apparently, many tracking libraries like fingerprinting, JS, and Castle, they actually have included extensions in their suit to basically track extensions and then eventually users for whatever reasons. Well, we know about extensions that they can behave differently on the client side, right? They can exhibit different sort of behaviors and these behaviors could then eventually be used to track users. How do we know about this? There have been a lot of research work uh, uh, in the academic community done about this. Yeah, and then there are a lot of more papers than just these three that I've mentioned here. But we are not sitting in an academic conference here, right? Why is this important? Um, well, this must be very common for you guys to see every now and then, right? Ad blocker detected. How does it happen? Websites, fingerprint extensions, or try to identify their existence, right? I'm not sure about how old or new this is, but then apparently LinkedIn also nowadays is trying to understand what sort of extensions people have installed when they visit to their website. And I'm guessing there are many more websites doing this, right? So this is, the, this is where it gets uh, into the core of extension fingerprinting. It's just not about tracking users. It's, just, it's also about tracking extensions for whatever reasons that websites find it interesting. It could be for more, uh, business gains, monetary gains. It could be for something else, but we don't know. So yes, this is, this is where uh, we dived into this and we thought this could be interesting to look at, right? Um, so now it gets technical. So I would like you to wake up. Oh, so, so there's been plenty of work done in extension fingerprint, how, how you could uh, fingerprint extensions. But what we focused on um, is the fact that extensions often inject JavaScript into the web page. I'm not talking about the content script here, but you know, the kind of script that you inject. We saw this uh, before in Simeon's slide uh, where you use uh, document.append element and stuff, right? Yeah, thanks for that. I'm going to use many more examples from your slides. So yes, we have an extension, we have a uh, website, Website has its own web page, uh, JavaScript, and then the content of it, right? And then uh, there comes an extension which tries to inject something into the web page. It gets interesting in terms of the execution of these scripts. So think of a very basic example here, like the, the injected script tries to write into the document title here. Now, the web page can basically overwrite all the existing APIs that is also accessible to the injected script, and then basically log all the access, the further invocations and access to what injected script could do. Well, this could be a problem for your extension. I mean, fingerprinting is just one thing, right? So basically they can log all the accesses and see like what sort of extension invoked what in APIs and then what was basically done with it, right? So this was just one example, maybe another, another, uh, more relatable example for you guys. Um, well, same thing. There's another injected script. Now, what it does is it just iterates over an array, now, right? Similar thing, um, what web, web page could do is just write 
into uh, overwrite into all the API uh, that is accessible again. We are talking about array dot prototype, right? So what could happen again? Basically, they could log all the accesses here, and then yes, wh how do they overwrite, or what kind of uh, what sort of data do can they collect here? So when they could overwrite the APIs, they could of course collect the parameters that was passed to it. So for example, in this case, foo bar and bars. Of course, they can also go up the tree and collect the in caller code from the API execution point. This is not always possible when, you know, the JavaScript has um, constructs like use strict and stuff because it doesn't allow the caller code to be visible. But then again, stack trace is always visible. You can always, uh, or the attacker JavaScript could always throw an error and then collect the stack trace up until the point uh, of, of the execution. So the stack trace could always be something that could be collected from the invocation. And then injected script is basically one, uh, visible to the web page JavaScript. Okay, and there's another case that we looked into um, that extensions, um, yes, wait, why does it not work? Should work? Should work? Okay, okay, we are getting there. Perfect, yes. Um, so that was about API invocations, but then these injected scripts could also register variables, right? And these are global variables that we are talking about. Of course, we are talking about just not the same context of execution, but also the same global JavaScript namespace, right? A web page JavaScript can just simply enumerate over all the window objects or window properties here and then try to infer what sort of extension install what variable. And then we have a fingerprinting problem here. Very basic, very simple, right? And then we have a global variable pollution. It's it's not even pollution, it's it's intended behavior in, in some sense, right? But then this could lead to fingerprinting. Yeah, so in a nutshell, extensions inject JavaScript and these JavaScript execution traces is visible to the website JavaScript. And this could lead to fingerprinting and other things. There was something else that we also looked for. Um, yeah, extensions often store data on the client side. Well. Uh, you would assume that they use Chrome.Stories API, but that's not actually the case um, that we observe. Not all the time, in fact. So yes, they could use any sort of client-side storage APIs that's available. It's it's just not injected script that I'm talking about. It's also the content script, right? So they have access to uh, different APIs and they could store this data. But interestingly, this is, of course, also accessible to the web page JavaScript. And then they can just poll uh, through all these APIs that are available to understand what extensions stored which data and at what time. And this could lead to fingerprintability. And when I talk about client-side storage APIs, I'm not talking about Chrome.Storage, but other APIs like local storage, IndexedDB, and other things. And this similarly goes into the direction of post message API, where, for, for example, the injected script tries to communicate with the content scripts by sending through a post message because there's no other way to do so, right? And a web page JavaScript could simply in intercept this by registering an, a message handler. Okay, so these are the two cases that we, uh, a few cases that we looked for or we thought could be interesting. And then, Basically, we asked ourselves a question that, you know, how many extensions are actually fingerprintable through the cases that we just looked for uh, in the wild at the moment, right? And then we built a tool, uh, we uh, do large scale stuff. So we basically try to analyze all the extensions that fit our categories. And then we build a tool called Raider to do so. And it's going to be a small depiction of the pipeline, how we start about things. So yes, we download all the extensions from the Chrome Web Store. We go about things by unzipping it, and then we try to understand how many extensions actually have a content script or a web accessible resource, which could uh, do interactions with, you know, uh, client-side storage APIs or could even execute in the namespace of the uh, web page. We try to understand this, and then we select this um, these extensions for our further test. And as, again, Semyon mentioned before, extensions could also inject this from the background by using scripting permissions. So we also collect these extensions for our test. And yeah, then for each of these extensions, we basically spawn a browser instance, load them, visit our honey pages, basically. So these honey pages are nothing but a HTML, a very simple HTML files, but they basically capture all the executions and interaction of an extension on, on our page to understand what sort of traces could be used for fingerprinting. 
So we do this for all our extensions nine times to rule out any inconsistencies. And then we basically send this to server side and then later analyze this to understand how many traces are unique and then could also even be attributable to an individual extensions. So this is about a pipeline, how, how, how we go about things uh, for large scale measurements. And of course, it's just not about, you know, the pipeline. We back up with numbers here. Boring numbers? Yes. So there are a lot of extensions, 180k extensions. I think I checked yesterday, but then not all extensions have scripting permissions or even uh, content script or walls that execute on all URLs. So we analyzed 38k extensions. And then we found actually around 2.7k extensions are fingerprintable in the Chrome ecosystem at the moment. And this, by the way, is something that we did. It's very lower bound number because we do not sort of do any sort of interaction on the web page. So we are not clicking on any settings or doing anything on the web page. This is just, you know, dumb measurement. My measurement, but not Tom. So, um, so yes. Um, well, looking into more gran granularity now. Um, yes, one thing that we definitely observe was that extensions do and more often inject JavaScripts uh, into the global namespace, and this led to fingerprinting. And talking about some of these vectors, so some of you might know. I might know that uh, in Mozilla, um, the stack traces or the extension identifiers are always randomized. So what we did was like, we thought maybe, okay, let's think of an ideal world and understand that even Chrome was to deploy this, uh, that, you know, the stack traces are by default randomized. And then, you know, this could be changed by developers on demand. So we basically normalized all the stack traces, removed all the identifiers of the extension and found that only 200 less extensions are actually um, removed from our fingerprinting database. So most of the extensions are just simply fingerprintable through the stack trace that we collect, which is again followed by global variables. This, this came as of a surprise. We thought like extensions, maybe they use, you know, constructs like let and const rather than war or do not, um, register variables on the global namespace, but apparently they do. And then, yeah, as around 300 extensions, they store data on local storage or index DB and whatnot. And then they were fingerprintable through this. And I'm talking about fingerprintable numbers, not the number of extensions that actually interact with this. So they may be even more than that, right? And then lastly, so of course, not all extensions are just fingerprintable through storage interactions or just through registering a global variable. This could be interesting because if we combine these features, so for example, storage when combined with stack trace, this yields to around 1,200 more extensions to be fingerprintable. So it's just not one factor of the extension that could lead to fingerprinting. Okay, let's talk more realistic. You, people do not just use one extension when they are browsing on the web. And this is what we wanted to understand, right? So people have multiple extensions and these multiple extensions might interfere with their execution behavior. Um, what we basically did in here was like we loaded multiple sort of extensions that uh, we randomly sampled from our uh, reported set, uh, reported lot from before. And what we did was, yeah, okay, fine. Uh, we uh, load extensions in a set of two, three, four, until 10 and try to understand what sort of behavior do they ex um, expose to the website. And interestingly, the vectors were quite reliable that way. Uh, the accuracy was around 98%. So we just tried to do things more realistically here in terms of um, how, how uh, people would also imitate this on, 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 uh, on a daily basis. And these vectors, uh, the extension by default do exhibit behavior even in multiple uh, extension environment. Some of the cases that did not work out was mostly because of um, JavaScript event loop interference rather than uh, our inability to, you know, um, the extension's inability to expose those behaviors. Maybe if we ran our experiments for, I don't know, two minutes or five minutes, maybe we also so saw those behaviors. But yeah, this is about multiple extension environment. And then, um, not many people like to do it, but I wanted to touch on Firefox as well. Um, so we analyzed around like around 10,000 extensions and we found 572 to be fingerprintable. This is, again, just like a lower bound, which is also one-fifth of all the extensions that we see on the Chrome Web Store. But just want to um, 
put this into perspective that the trends that we see are exactly identical to what we see in the Chrome. So underlying the problem that it's not exactly a platform problem, it's a platform agnostic problem. It's also a standard agnostic problem because 64% of our extensions were even MV3. So the problems that we are looking at, it's, it's not specific to a platform or a standard here. And the trends also look quite uh, even identical uh, in terms of the vectors that were, that were popular here. Okay, so we did our evaluation. We found some things. What what do we do next? We do disclosures. I mean, at least we do disclosures. Um, we re we try to reach out to all the developers that we found to be um, affected by our study. Um, Unfortunately, we could only find 2K emails, um, but then we tried to notify them about this problem. Uh, for that, we also tried to build a proof of concept test bed, basically, so that, you know, developers could just load their extension, go to this page and try to understand what exactly is happening rather than reading, um, I don't know, thousand letter email about it. Um, well, some people who did respond back to us, I don't think there were many people, I think this was, there was 30 or 35 people, but then... Um, they did say that, yeah, okay, fine, this is a problem. Um, many of them even said, what is even extension fingerprinting? Why should I even be bothered about it? But I, I think this comes as no surprise to us, uh, at least as researchers, because I don't know, because there are more, far more important things to take care of on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but yes, so they did indicate that, yeah, okay, fine, we will try to sift this behavior or maybe patch this behavior in coming days to understand um, or to maybe just fix this problem. Some of them even indicated that this is a very important feature. We, we do need to interact with the stories uh, or we do need to inject scripts because there are React libraries or AngularJS libraries where DOM only loads after a while and then we really need to inject that script into the namespace to get hold of the DOM and stuff. I'm, not, I'm no React expert here, but I could understand uh, what, what sort of problem were leading to it. I also looked at the source code. So yeah, th these might even be like a really, really necessary behavior in there. Well, um, unfortunately at the moment, uh, what we are talking about injections, script injections, there are no um, mitigation strategies from the, um, from the browser level. But yeah, I mean, some people even mentioned this, like they said, it should be platform's responsibility. I mean, we cannot account for fingerprintability and all, all sort of privacy and security issues that might even exist. So why do I mention this here? Because we have browser vendors in, our, in this very room. So any thoughts here? Maybe we can discuss this. Oh, you already have one. Please. <laughs> Test? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the web extension community group, we are currently actively discussing new API proposals to allow extensions to directly run code inside the main world mm -hmm. without requiring injection. That would offer extensions others a way to get what they need without these downsides. Mm -hmm. And I agree that some of these things could be solved at the browser level, but things like global variables, um, well, that's a problem of extensions. They should not do that. It's generally bad practice to pull it to global namespace. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I know that Mozilla and Chrome and Brave and all other browser uh, extension ecosystem is working towards this. That's why we have a um, recommendation slide next. And as you mentioned about it, you know, MV2, oh no, content script executing in the uh, main world. I think that that's where this slide comes into picture. So we do have some solution for, we do have some recommendations for the extension developers. If we look at this problem, what exactly the problem here is in this case, even if you look, try to load your extension at document start, there's no guarantee as such that the injected script will execute before webpage.js. And that's very much the problem because webpage.js could just, you know, overwrite all sort of APIs and then uh, interfere with the injected JS in this case. How about we switch this? Can we switch this? Actually, we can, because if we are using uh, in the manifest v3 um, ecosystem, if we are injecting the content script into the main world, the content script always gets the um, clean reference to these APIs. And they can even object freeze these APIs to maybe avoid any tamper at, at a later point of time. So, yes, the extension injected scripts should execute first, or at least before the web based JavaScript. What about? A random uh, global variables. 
if possible, extension developers may use immediately invoke function expressions. If you're aware of this, these are basically a function expressions which are executed and then this, the context is destroyed. So basically, there's no trace of the variables which are set on um, the global this or the window object. So for for I mean, of course, th this is not like a one size fits all solution, but then this is like a developer, uh, secure development sort of recommendations that we have. It might work in all cases, it might not. So that's that's that. And for stories, I mean, of course, we have this Chrome.Stories API. So there are, I'm not familiar with um, all the cases why extension developers would want to interact with local storage and session storage. I have some anecdotal evidences, but then I think Chrome.Stories should be able to solve most of the problems that, that uh, leads to fingerprinting in this case. Okay. Um, okay. This is... Towards the end of um, uh, my presentation, so I'd just like to summarize. We found three new vectors, basically. There have been a lot of work in this direction. Uh, even extensions that try to modify the DOM, they are fingerprintable through that, through mutation observer and such. So we just looked into th three new vectors, and then we found like around 3,000 uh, extensions to be fingerprintable across the ecosystem. And then unfortunately, at the moment, uh, Modern browser architecture do not solve all the problems that we discussed so far. And then, of course, we responsibly notify to the developers to understand what sort of issues leads to this. And then most of them said that this is necessary for them, uh, for the ex extension to survive or, you know, um, for the user's expectations. And then in the end, um, for extension developers today and tomorrow, we basically... Um, open source our honey pages and the extension data set so that they can look on this, they can even test their extension as and when they go through the development processes before publishing, and they can be sure about the fact that their extension is not fingerprintable. So this is uh, this presentation was part of our work. Um, if you would like to see more details, uh, please uh, follow our papers. And that's about it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, feel free to ask questions now.